Okay, so you might be wondering what is practical astronomy exactly? Well, by as a dictionary defined, it's just a bunch of astronomy that used to be related for calculations of celestial bodies for navigation as well as other commercial finding purposes for the Earth. Yeah, you can, you can use you can use instruments like binoculars or telescopes or even just your naked eye to observe all the astronomical objects including stars, galaxies, nebulae, as well as planets. So, like as you know, the universe is very big and there are a lot of celestial objects like, like what billions of stars around the universe. So you might be wondering like, how do you find them since like, we need a reference system to locate all these stars. Well, astronomers have developed astronomical coordinate systems that allow us to pinpoint the location of stars just like how maps allow us to pinpoint the location of places on Earth. So there are two common celestial coordinate systems. In reality, there are like five or six of them, but the rest are not commonly used, so we only cover the two of them. <coughs> as well as the celestial system, also called the equatorial system. The celestial system is the most commonly used one by most amateur and professional astronomers because it's like more intuitive. Yeah, so basically, as you can see on the screen, this is the diagram of them. It might seem a bit confusing at first, but I'll show a video which will help me explain to you all how it works. The video will only cover the equatorial system since it's the de facto standard used by most astronomers and the altitude azimuth system is not really that widely used. So I'll show the video. Yeah. 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 How the sky moves. Look up on a clear night and you'll notice that the sky looks like a vast dome with stars fixed to its inner surface. If the earth were transparent, you'd see the stars on the other half of the starry sphere below your feet, and you'd get the impression that you were standing at the center of a velvety black sphere speckled with stars. Astronomers call this the celestial sphere. The earth spins in space, rotating once a day on its axis. But from an observer's point of view, the Earth appears to remain still while the celestial sphere seems to rotate once a day around an axis that runs from the North Celestial Pole to the South Celestial Pole. These imaginary points are above the Earth's North and South Poles, so all the stars, planets, moon, and sun on the celestial sphere also appear to move all the way around the sky once each day, rising in the east and setting in the west. The North Star, Polaris, lies very near the rotational axis of the celestial sphere, right about the Earth's North Pole. Since it's almost right on the North Celestial Pole, Polaris appears to stay fixed in the night sky all night and all year. Any other star in the celestial sphere south of Polaris rotates in circles around the pole star. Stars above the Earth's equator rotate in circles with the largest diameters during their daily motion across the celestial sphere. And south of the equator, stars trace out circles with smaller apparent diameters as they lie closer to the south celestial pole. Now, there is no bright star, no southern star that corresponds to Polaris at the south celestial pole. Like the stars and planets, the sun also appears to move on the celestial sphere. If you measure the time when the sun is highest in the sky, you'll find it takes exactly 24 hours for the sun to move all the way around the celestial sphere and return to its highest point. In fact, that's how we define a day, or what astronomers call a solar day. It's a little different with stars. If you go out at night and select a star to observe and measure its position on the celestial sphere, you'll find it takes almost 24 hours to move all the way around and get back to the same spot. If you measure accurately, you'd find it only takes 23 hours and 56 minutes for a star to get back to the same position in the sky where it was the night before. That's because during the day, the Earth revolved around the sun by one 
365th of its orbit. So each day, you look at a slightly different direction in space, and every star appears to rise four minutes earlier each night. In two weeks, the star rises about an hour earlier. In one month, the star rises two hours earlier. And in 12 months, it appears to move all the way around the sky, back to the position at which you first saw it in the previous year. This apparent motion, where the stars rise a little earlier each night, explains why the stars you see in the winter sky are different than what you see in the spring, the summer, and the autumn. Celestial coordinates. Maps of the Earth are marked with latitude and longitude, a north-south-east-west grid system that helps us locate places on the Earth's surface. Latitude measures degrees how far north or south of the equator a place lies. The equator has a latitude of zero degrees. The north and south poles have a latitude of 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south, respectively. Chicago has a latitude of 41.8 degrees north. Sydney, Australia has a latitude of 34 degrees south. Longitude measures how far east and west a place lies on the Earth's surface. But how far east and west of what? The current reference point of longitude is the great circle that runs through the Earth's poles and the Royal Greenwich Observatory in London, UK. So, Greenwich is the zero degree longitude. Chicago, west of Greenwich, has a longitude of 88 degrees west. Sydney has, Sydney, east of London, is longitude 151 degrees east. So, why is all this important to you? Because astronomers locate things in the sky using the celestial equivalent of longitude and latitude. Imagine the Earth's equator lines of latitude and longitude projected outwards onto the celestial sphere. The celestial equator lies directly above the Earth's equator, and the north and south celestial poles are above the Earth's celestial, uh, the Earth's north and south poles. Lines of latitude and longitude are there as well, but in the sky, latitude is called declination. The celestial equator has a declination of zero degrees north and south of the celestial equator. Declination is marked with a plus or a minus sign. The star Vega, for example, has a declination of plus 38.8 degrees. The southern star, Acheron, has a declination of about 57 degrees. Each degree is split into 60 smaller units that we call minutes of arc measured by an apostrophe, and each minute is split into 60 seconds of arc, marked by a quotation mark. So the more precise declination of Akronar is minus 57 degrees, 14 minutes, 12 seconds. The celestial equivalent to longitude is right ascension. It's measured not in degrees, but in hours, from zero to 24. Astronomers cooked up this arrangement long ago because of the celestial sphere appears to turn once every 24 hours. With 24 hours in the, in the full 360 degrees of sky, each hour co corresponds to 15 degrees of angular distance. Like degrees, each hour is split into 60 minutes and 60 seconds. So the right ascension of Akronar, for example, is 1 hour, 37 minutes, 43 seconds. Vega is at right ascension 18 hours, 36 minutes, 56 seconds. The great circle with a right ascension of zero hours runs through the point in the constellation Pisces at which the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator and right ascension increases going eastward. So that's the basics of the celestial coordinate system. You'll see these numbers in astronomy books and magazines to describe the positions of objects on the celestial sphere. And you'll see the coordinates marked on the pages of star atlases to help you find them.
So just like on the ground, you cannot see beyond the horizon. And on the sky, you also cannot see beyond the so-called horizon because the Earth is curved. So therefore, people in the northern hemisphere will see different stuff from people in the southern hemisphere. And later on, as we explore things like star maps, you, they will take into account things like that. Okay, so moving on to telescopes. Telescopes are basically instruments designed to observe remote objects in the sky as they increase the magnification of the objects and the brightness to allow you to observe them. And there are many types of telescopes like radio, x-ray, submillimeter, and infrared. But right now we are only talking about optical telescopes. That means telescopes that use light rays to make into an image. So basically there are three types of optical telescopes. Reflectors, refractors, and catadioptrics. As their name suggests, reflector telescopes use concave mirrors to magnify and reflect light with your eyes. So basically, as you, if you can see my cursor, basically the light from a far away star enters through the aperture of the telescope and it reflects off the primary mirror to the secondary mirror and finally through the eyepiece where it's, and which is where you see the star or any astronomical object. The advantages include that they are cheaper than refractor telescopes and their large apertures allow for the capture of very faint celestial objects like very dim stars. Also, they are very compact and portable. However, the disadvantages include that since the tube of the refractor telescope is open, that means you know dust can fall inside and you'll need to frequently clean the optics to prevent it from getting scratched or getting blurry. Also, their optics are easily misaligned due to their open tube design. It's an inherent flaw in the design. So, refractor telescopes. Refractor telescopes work on a different principle than reflector as they refract light instead of reflect light. Reflect means, reflect means like a mirror, the light reflects on the surface. Refract means you bend the light, it's not reflect, you bend it. So, in this case, Light rays from distant objects and those who are sexually and above, you all should have learned that light from a distant object is parallel, like they arrive parallel in parallel waves. So basically they pass through a lens first and they'll converge. And they'll converge all the way until the eyepiece, which is where you see the image. <coughs> the advantages are that they are rugged because they are of a closed tube design and hence they are not prone to misalignment. Also, due to the closed tube design, they rarely requ require any maintenance or fencing. Also, the images are sharper than reflector telescopes. However, the disadvantages are that they suffer from chromatic aberration, which is basically a distortion of some color sometimes. Also, their cost is higher than reflector telescopes, and it is quite difficult to make a glass lens with no imperfections and perfect curvature on both sides of the lens due to limitations of current manufacturing technology. So the last type we are going to cover is catadioptrics. Catadioptrics are telescopes that try to maximize the best properties of refractors and reflectors while trying to minimize their disadvantages. It's basically like trying to combine the best and reduce the worst of both. They, and how they do this, they use a combination of both lenses and mirrors. So as you can see, the smith hasselgren telescope, which is one of the types of catadioptric telescopes, you can see how it works. The light basically enters through the left side of the image, reflects off a mirror and another mirror, and then passes through a lens here, which is not a diagram, and reflects into the eyepiece. So basically, as you can see, it uses both lenses and mirrors to reflect and refract light onto the eyepiece for you to see. The advantages is that it combines both the advantage of lenses and mirrors while cancelling their disadvantages. Also, it is good for astrophotography, fast film, or CCDs. Also, just like refractors, it is very easy to maintain and it is very compact and durable just like the reflector telescope. However, the disadvantages include that it is quite expensive and also it is very heavy for its small size. So right now, we will see the basic parts of a telescope. 
this part, this part is the that control, which is basically where the light from the celestial object comes in. And this is the focuser, which is a knob that is turned in order to focus the image on the eye so that it's sharp enough to see or photograph. And this is the mount, which is very obvious. It's just a it's just a tripod where you place the telescope upon. And optical tube, I think I know you explain. It's just a it's just a tube containing all the sensory and stuff. And the eyepiece here is where you put your eye to see the to see the image. And okay, so right now this is a quite important part. This is the final scope. It has, it's on top of the telescope, right inside the eyepiece. What it does is that it sort of acts as a scope for the telescope, just like a scope on a rifle. Like a final scope, right? It is aligned as the same direction as the aperture. However, its its zoom level is lower than that of actual telescope. I say the telescope has 25 times zoom, then maybe the final scope only has two times zoom. But you might be wondering, like, what is this for? Why need a final scope? You can just put through the eyepiece and align the telescope. Well, that's because due to lower zoom. The finder scope has a larger field of view, and so it will allow you to pinpoint the rough location of the stars you want to observe. <coughs> and then, once you align the telescope, you switch to the eyepiece to view the magnified version of the image. So basically, it helps in finding stars for you to observe. And this is another image of a telescope you can see even though it looks different but actually the components are roughly the same you still have the final scope eyepiece focuser or eagle tube while the mount is replaced by the base but it has no effect on its function so right now we will watch another video to learn how to use a telescope such as a line there and actually look into that Oh yeah, just before I show the video, I'd like to say that this is this telescope uses the equatorial coordinate system, so it's called an uh, equatorial bar. Welcome to Eyes on the Sky. My name is Dave Fuller, and I try to make it easier to understand the science of astronomy. In this video, I'll be discussing how to set up in a line a telescope on an equatorial mount, sometimes known as a German equatorial mount. Now, for the newcomer, there can be a myriad of knobs and clutches and angles that don't seem to make a lot of sense. But hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll be able to set up and align your mount with ease. So let's begin. In this video, we'll cover the following. Latitude, leveling and balancing, alignment and starting point, the celestial pole, and polar alignment. First, take your telescope off of your mount. We'll be doing some adjustments to the mount, and this will help avoid any accidents that could damage your scope. Do a quick internet search of where you live, or a large city or town within 100 miles or so, and find your approximate latitude. Find the latitude scale on your mount, which may look like this, or this. And then, after unlocking the clutch, set the pointer on the latitude scale to the latitude at or near the latitude of where you live. Relock the latitude adjustment. It doesn't have to be perfect for right now. Within a few degrees is fine. Next is leveling the tripod and mount. A good way to avoid accidental tip overs with your equatorial mount is to make sure that the entire assembly is level on the ground. If your mount doesn't have a bubble level on the mount, like this, you can tape a large coin to a piece of string and hold it directly underneath the center of your telescope. If the coin hangs right over the middle of the eyepiece tray, then it's level. The next step is often misunderstood, but it's very important, and that is balancing your scope. There are two axes to an equatorial mount, so let's start with the right ascension axis. Very often, there are setting circles on the right ascension axis, and it's likely the larger of the setting circles, like this, 
or this. This is the axis that has the telescope on one side and the counterweight on the other. Begin by setting up your telescope similar to how you'd be using it at night. So start by placing your telescope back onto the mount and put a low power eyepiece in the focuser. These will often have a 20, 25, or 26 printed on them somewhere, like these. Now unlock the right ascension clutch and rotate the mount so that your telescope is off to one side, like this. Holding the telescope with one hand and leaving the clutch unlocked, release the set screw on the counterweight and slide the counterweight back and forth on the counterweight shaft until you can feel that the telescope tube neither drops nor rotates back up. It should be well balanced. Unlock this clutch and turn the telescope. Most mounts will have the telescope tube in some kind of rings or cradle. Loosen the cradle or ring box just enough that the tube can slide back and forth. This axis is a bit harder to get balanced well, especially with lighter tubes, but if you sort of set the scope sideways, then push it back and forth, you can get an idea of which side may still be heavy, like this. Adjust as necessary. When you're satisfied that the telescope tube is well balanced in this axis, point the telescope so that it is straight up over the equatorial mount, then relock the clutch. Now your scope is in the starting position. I know, I know, all that just to get to the starting position. <laughs> It helps to understand why an equatorial mount was developed. Recall that the Earth spins on its axis, making one rotation in 24 hours. Well, as the Earth spins, the objects in the sky appear to move across the sky. But in reality, they're not moving. It's us that are the ones that are spinning. Look at this video of a sped up representation of the night sky. All that is due to the Earth spinning, not the stars themselves spinning over us. So because we're spinning, we want to be able to point a telescope at a given object in the sky, say the moon or Jupiter or even another galaxy, and keep that object centered in the eyepiece without it drifting out of the field of view. That's what an equatorial mount does. And with a motor drive or slow motion control, it keeps the night sky object stationary in the eyepiece. So, how do we set up our equatorial mount to counteract the spinning of the Earth on its axis so that objects don't drift out of the field of view in our eyepiece? Uh, okay, so due to time constraints, we won't cover this part of the video. We'll continue with the presentation. <laughs> Okay, so we are not covered star charts. Star charts are basically astronomical maps, just like the market go along. A pseudo tree, which is the aperture, the exposure, and the sensitivity. So we're covering those in detail, and uh, to see how you are going to shoot a photograph. So a uh, higher aperture, which is a lower f number, means that it lets more light in. So like it's, it makes for a better photograph. However, at the same time, if you have a low, low uh, if you have a larger aperture, which is a lower f number, it means that you have a, a your depth of view is shallower. Means that you can only focus on objects at a specific distance at, at one time. So for astrophotography, we tend to use aperture that's somewhere in the middle. Uh, this is sort of a balance because if you have too small aperture, you can't let in enough light to get the clear star images, and you have a too large aperture. Uh, there will be noise from nearby cities like, and other lighting. So we tend to go for somewhere in the middle. Next is uh, ISO. ISO is, uh, well, ISO depends, uh, will also determine how bright your image is. For, uh, for actual photography, we tend to also use uh, ISO somewhere in the middle. Not too, not too low, such that the picture is bright enough, but not too high, because as you can see from a uh, high ISO uh, set, you know, there's a lot of in the image, which makes the image uh, not so small. What does ISO stand for? Actually, it's, it doesn't say what I think. 
it's actually it's a it's actually Pulau Kai. It's not that you said point. There's a third point by that. It's whole it's whole sensitive of Japan. So it's a higher eye. It's a brighter image. But there are always drawbacks and there are always drawbacks. For instance, a higher eye will means it's more green from your image. So uh finally the shutter speed setting. A slower shutter speed will mean that you let in more light. So you can uh, capture better photographs. You can see uh, on the left is the uh, will be the faster shutter speed setting and on the right will be slower shutter speed setting. If you are going to ca capture stars that are skewed, or it's best if you use a slightly lower shutter speed setting, maybe 30 seconds. Uh, so that the stars won't move in the time. If if you want even a longer shutter speed setting, then you can mount your mount your camera on top of the telescope and use the tracking mount to track the stars from the sky. So you can leave it there for hours at a time and it will produce a very flat image.